framework. Do some normative frameworks uniquely present particular questions for evaluation? And where normative frameworks imply divergent criteria, how should legal and social institutions mediate that dispute? So I think we'll see that our speakers have grappled with these uh, questions about questions in a very thoughtful and thought-provoking uh, way. And each one will speak for about 12 minutes, following which we'll open it up for questions. So we'll begin with Professor Arreola. Here, wherever you like. I'll be sitting down. I'm a little tired this morning. Um, okay, so I want to start. First of all, I wanted to really thank um, Jeremy, Eva, and the team that made this organizing this really thought-provoking conference, and also um, give a special thanks to Claire, who did help very much with logistics. I want to start off by just saying this paper reflects a broader project. So what I'm trying to do here is to really give a digestible piece, and hopefully, it's digestible and intelligible. But it reflects uh, under, the underlying research of what I'm going to talk about today is, is, um, is related to a book that I'm writing. Um, the, the title of the book is called Black Face Black Music, Law, Culture, and Movement, Global Markets. So the, fo the focus of the book project is to consider the transformative nature of 20th century musical forms that originated in music of former slaves. And it basically reflects my overriding, the overriding questions that I tend to ask tend to be rooted in, in two separate aspects of my own experience. I am a law professor, but I'm also an anthropologist, so I inevitably ask questions about context. And I think that's something that came out quite a bit in the first panel. But I think sometimes, as lawyers and law professors, we often tend to not think about context. As an anthropologist, it's what I tend to think about first. So this book is basically looking at music in context and looking at how law interrelates with questions related to music in particular context or the space of time. Now, the second part of the book that is a part I'm going to talk about more in my remarks today relates to actual musical practice. As many of you may know, I'm, I'm a musician. I've studied classical voice probably as long as the time period since Mark's been a, a boy scout. So I've taken, <laughs> <laughs> I've taken a lot of classical voice lessons. I still study, I and mean, I, I usually see a voice teacher and a vocal coach if I can every week. So my engagement with music has made me, I think, think about musical context in a way that may be slightly different um, than even an anthropologist. So those two aspects of context are going to color my remarks today. So um, one of the things I want to talk about are the impact of cultural and musical context. So the question and the general focus of my remarks today will relate to underlying conceptions of musical practice within copyright law and the impact of actual context and histories of musical practice and experience. And I want to talk about two issues today. Um, the first issue I, I, I want to talk about is what I call paradoxes. And the second issue I want to talk about, which was actually the focus of what I intended to talk about was about confusion. Um, but let me talk about paradoxes first. Um, I think both confusion and paradoxes relate to collaboration. And I've been thinking about paradoxes and control, and I, I would have to say, I would have to admit that this is to some degree been inspired by um, Prince's death history, which, which I think for, for me, it, it was, had a huge impact. He had a huge impact on me in thinking about and relating to music. And I think he's a particularly interesting figure because he highlights some trends in music <coughs> in the country that I think are worth noting and thinking about. And these trends basically relate to what I call paradox, paradoxes of collaboration. I think as Peter Yazzie and a number of other scholars have written about extensively, we have issues in copyright in how we think about collaborativity and how we incorporate collaborativity. We may recognize that in theory, but in practice, it's very difficult for us to think about how we should think about collaboration, both on the creation side and collaboration in terms of how people use and consume music. So I think Prince was a very interesting and unique example, right? Because he was a unique artist in many important respects. Uh, and I would argue that a key element of his success, like, like as is the case with many musicians, a key element of his, of his success was his ability to blend and synthesize different elements of existing music. So Prince was really known as um, synthesizing existing strands of R&B, blues, punk, soul pop, rock and roll, and other musical genres, and combining them in a new and interesting way that still engages our ear. I mean, he, he's, he's been a, for, for, for the time period, from the time that he emerged until his death, was really a, a incredibly influential artist on the music scene. Influential not because of just of his songwriting, but also because he was an extraordinary performer. So on many different levels, he was, he was a unique musician. Now, his ability to use existing music is a testament to the importance of enabling collaboration and sharing in musical creation. Um, and his strong desire, at the same time, Prince had a really strong desire to control his music. And that's why there are a lot of legal cases involving Prince. Um, he, he had an 18 year long dispute with his record company, Warner Music, and eventually did gain control of some of his rights, um, which I think is a 
model that other artists would like to follow. An, an artist who is prominent and as successful as he is would obviously have incentive and the ability to be able to wrest some of those rights back um, from from um, from the uh, from the recording companies. At the same time, the emphasis on, on control showed a dark side that became increasingly apparent in the digital era, um, where with control over dissemination. Um, became something that he really focused on. In these contexts, his focus on control led to, led to Universal, where um, Universal Music uh, gave a takedown of it against, I, I can remember who was in the Dance of Baby with the Prince song. <coughs> I, I can never really hear very well. Um, but yeah, I guess that's, that's sort of a subjective judgment. <laughs> Needless to say, Universal lost, and um, the Ninth Circuit issued an uh, amended opinion last month in that case. So that was a case where desire for control reflects some of the issues of control that we see particularly on the distribution side of the digital era that are increasingly problematic. How can we share it and collaborate? And how do we have access to, have access to and consume music? And this is a big issue today, of course, with discussions of streaming. Now, in Prince's case, I don't know how many of you tried to actually find Prince's music online yesterday, and I'm not sure how many of you encountered success. <laughs> because Prince, because he was so opposed to what I would call modern at modern ways of disseminating music is not available on Spotify. There's very limited availability of his music on iTunes, so it's very hard to find his music. I somehow have his music in my iTunes folder, and I think it's because I might have had it in the CDs that I, that, I, that I uploaded at some point. No, not uploaded, but I, I um, put up into my iTunes folder at some point. But I do think it points out some of the paradoxes of collaboration, and that it's, it's very easy for some people to use existing music. Now, typically, the story that we've seen for much of the 20th century has been a story of uses of African American music by non-African Americans and questions and issues related to appropriation. Prince himself was African American, but I don't think that changes the nature of the questions we have about how the, the ability to collaborate is important for creation, but that I think it's also important for creators then we really need to think about and calibrate appropriately how much control creators have over works and for how long obviously an ongoing debate in copyright, and it's, it's especially pertinent in music. So I just added those remarks because I think I was inspired to think about them a bit by, by the unfortunate um, death of Prince history. Now the focus of my remarks, but this, I think thinking about Prince highlights the central tensions and paradoxes that can sound up surrounding the questions of control and compensation of copyright that are continuing and at times unresolved. Now the real focus of the paper, where I wrote this paper, relates to um, what I call confusion about music. Now when we think about music, we all experience, I'm, I'm really curious, I just did it for a slide how many people here read music? So we have a fair number of people that actually do music. How many people read music on a regular basis as a form of musical consumption? <laughs> or music, how many people perform? Okay, so we have some performers. But I would say most of us experience music um, on oral, right? We hear it, we might sing it. I, I sing sometimes in the shower. Um, with my voice teachers, I think. But we experience music orally, and there's a fundamental tension because when we think about copyright, copyrighted music, what we typically re are referring to is copyrighting the written form of music. Now, the written form of notated music, it does reflect a kind of musical expression, but I think it's important to keep in mind that the form of musical expression that you see that's written down is in the form of shorthand. Now, there are a lot of reasons historically how notation, the kind of notation that we see that we all use today, it, uh, emerged, and there, there were actually a lot of competing systems of notation at various points. And I'm focusing now just on the history of Western music because the notation, notational form that we use today came out of Western European art music, essentially. But it was one of many different competing forms of musical notation. Now, the, the issues and problems that arise from this, and where the confusion arises, and I, I know I only have five minutes, I'm going to be very quick and short, but basically we all rely on this written form of music. That written form is necessarily complete. It doesn't include, there's certain music features that just can't be written. Um, some because of my nature, timbre, for instance, you can't, you know, timbre sounds like the French horn. I mean, what does that mean? You can't really write that down effectively. So timbre is something you can't really notate. There are other musical features that um, are just difficult to notate. So rhythm, no matter what kind, it's not just sort of African polyrhythms that are difficult to notate. Rhythm in general is very hard to notate. So rhythm is one of those things you typically often need to learn morally because you have to hear it and then you have to try to repeat it. And now, because of the fact that we, we rely on copyright so much on the written form of music, and we experience music as an oral and heard and, and performed thing, um, leads to confusion and tension. And what, where, where this paper is going is I want to talk about um, <clears throat> how copyright and written composition, and particularly is based on written notated music, how when evidence is presented in copyright infringement cases, people often listen, the jury or the final fact often listens to music. That leads to, at least the, 
the, the one piece of college that's actually been discussed, that actually wrote a dissertation and a, at least a couple of articles about this, has noted that chaotic and haphazard way that music evidence is actually is actually presented in music in copyright infringement cases. And when you actually look at how courts present music in infringement cases, it's somewhat puzzling because I think it doesn't adequately take into account how we actually perceive music. When we move moving from paper to actually hearing music, it's more than just moving from the visual to the sound, to sound. It also involves uh, phenomenally different um, aspects of our brains that touch on our musical <coughs> experience. And this is something I started to think about a lot more in conversations with my husband. My husband's a guitarist, he's a classical guitarist, but he also plays acoustic guitar. And we'll also often listen to the same piece of music and we'll talk about it, and it's as if we heard two different pieces of music. It's, I, I, and, and, and because a lot of my musical experience has basically been with classical vocalists and other types of classical musicians, we share a lot of common assumptions. Um, guitar things, classical guitar things is a, little, is a little different for a lot of different reasons. We share common assumptions, and we can share a common vocabulary and understanding of how we use music. But we can't assume that that common understanding is uniform. We all relate to music because music has an emotional impact on us. I think that one of the best quotes I've heard about um, music is that we all uh, feel like we understand. Music is well regarded, everyone listens to music, but many of us don't fully understand music. So where, where, where I want to leave this is that in thinking about how we actually present musical evidence in copyright infringement cases, we need to think about the impact of actually hearing music and how different types of musical experiences may shape different understandings about listening to music itself. Because we all we don't hear music uniformly. I think in law we tend to assume that you know everyone hears the same thing. I know from practical experience that we don't all hear the same thing. When we actually look at studies on the psychology of music, they're considerably at odds with the assumptions we make and how we present music in copyright and infringement litigation. In particular, we tend to focus in law for obvious reasons on melody. This, there's a long history of why that, that's the case. However, it, it turns out that at least the studies of psychology of music to date suggest that timbre, which is musical color, so that's the equivalent of hearing the same, the same notes played by a flute versus a French horn. They would sound very different. It turns out that tends to be how we recognize music. So in, in thinking about the psychology of music, um, the neurology, the, the issues of uh, cognition and, and perception. I think we need to incorporate those to a better extent in how we actually present music and how we this. So very short, um, I'm hope, happy to talk about this more questions. Thank you. infringers. We give you some exclusive rights, 
you can go around taxing people who are infringing, you get a certain amount of money in your pocket, and that convinces you and maybe others, hey, I want to get into this business because it's profitable. If we set that system upright, then we, we make up for the shortfall, and we get the right number of people inventing. Um, okay, but there's a problem, and we've been dealing with this, uh, uh, that there's a lack of support. If we look at the utilitarian support board, we really can't tell if it's working. Okay, it's kind of interesting because we've had this system for a long time. And so, uh, and it's not just this justification, but we're at a time in the patent system where it's highly, highly controversial between uh, uh, broad, bad patents out of the PTO or patent trolls or the combination they're in. People are quite worried about uh, the patent system. And so this lack of support really is troubling. So we have some choices. What could we do? Well, uh, Rob said, well, let's look elsewhere. Right, or let's try to maybe put this aside for a moment and see can we support it in some other way. Uh, and <clears throat> so then, you know, we have uh, that's one choice, and so we have the other choice, which I think is maybe Mark's choice, is said, well, let's try harder. Like keep the utilitarian aspects, but keep getting more data. And it's a tough slog. Um, it hasn't been easy for the past 20 years, but we're making some progress, and let's keep our eye on that. Um, <clears throat> my question is, well, you know, and I, I support both approaches actually. Uh, but then the question is, well, you know, maybe we should look at these initial assumptions, right? That maybe the problem is that we particular we picked a way of framing the patent system that makes it very hard to do maybe either of these, but especially this one. Not always my argument that we've picked a pathological framing for the patent system, uh, one in, one which we're even if we keep trying, we're never going to resolve uh, these issues, and so. Maybe what we should do is also consider adjusting this framing, so then we, we go back to this justification. We maybe have an easier time. Um, uh, Mark me mentioned epicycles, and a way when, when uh, uh, um, there, there is a way in which uh, you know. Last night I don't know why I woke up at five o'clock, and I'm like this morning. And I'm like, right, how am I going to you know? What, what example would I use to explain this? Um, and, and I always remember doing some problem sets uh, uh, in my physics classes and. You'd sometimes try to set up a problem, and you could set it up in various ways, and you'd try, geez, these numbers are really, really hard. It's very hard to do these calculations. And all of a sudden, you have an aha moment. You say, oh, wait a minute. If we're talking about you know, the Earth going around the sun, rather than using rectilinear coordinates focused on the Earth, you say, wait a minute. Use a coordinate system focused or centered on the, uh, on the sun. Uh, all of a sudden, the equations start to make more sense. And that's the kind of view is that maybe we picked a weird way of doing it. Now, this story makes some sense, because you say, hey, we have a shortfall. What should we do? Well, let's just reward inventors and make up for that shortfall. So in a way, it makes sense up front. But then when we go to support it, I think it turns out to be what I would call pathological. <laughs> why? And so why is it pathological? Why do I think if we keep thinking of the patent system as something that rewards or induces, I think in a way, it's always going to be uh, unjustified in, in, in fact, Continuing to try to fight a utilitarian fight uh, about the reward system might actually be what what you could call pejoratively some kind of act of faith because it's just it's unfalsifiable and so maybe we should really change the way we're thinking. Okay, so what are some of the problems? Well, it seems up front you have to judge how much reward to give, right? Uh, and this is a problem. I don't know how much innovation we need compared to everything else. We don't do that in the rest of the economy, and so you might say, well, that's a problem. Uh, but you say, don't worry, maybe we, we should do something else. Pick any positive reward, figure out the costs and benefits, and then trial and error, let's start adjusting, right? And try to optimize what the proper scope and duration of a, uh, a patent should be. But we don't have any good tools. Because we have said what we're doing is we're trying to deviate from the market, we're trying to distort prices, I don't think we have the traditional tools um, that we need to judge costs and benefits. So just by our framing, we don't know how to set this up. We don't know how to find that solution. So I think we're really quite in trouble, even with these first two points. And I kind of ran out of space. There's a few more points I could put in. There's a whole number of issues why I think it's had a lot of. But one of these things is data that you know, creators really aren't moved by this incentive. We change the incentive. Their levels of, of inventing don't change much. Uh, and this is kind of interesting, so maybe we shouldn't frame the whole system as trying to reward them in this way. And maybe this last thing is quite interesting for me. Um, 
There's this funny thing about ideas, right? You put up this quote from Jefferson, you know, these ideas, this elegant way that ideas can spread, but you're like, I'm sorry, that's not what we're gonna do. In order for this system to work, is we actually have to exclude some people. That's the only way to, to provide a reward. And so in a, in a way, it troubles me that the one beautiful feature about ideas is one thing we say we're not gonna do when it comes to an IP system. And that partly, I think, comes from this inducing uh, notion. And so excluding is unfortunate, but it's not a bug in that system. When we see somebody being excluded, we're like, I'm sorry, that's the price we have to pay for the system. And so that bothers me a little bit, and I think would add to sort of the, one of these typologies. These are sort of utilitarian typologies, and these are sort of more public relations failures, right? Uh, but they all kind of mix together, and you know, and we can go back, uh, but there's some support for it. You know, Arrow even said, this is what we need to do. I'm, what I'm interested in is, is that the only way we can do it? Is there a different way? Or can we tweak the system a little bit, look at it with a different framing, and then we can go back to these justifications uh, uh, in a new way? And this is kind of like, let's just change our coordinate system. Maybe some solutions will come out uh, uh, in, in some better way. So what are some of the alternatives? Um, I've been thinking, a lot of people, uh, um, Rob and people like Paul Heald, uh, and I've been writing about, rather than thinking about uh, um, Incentives, let's focus more on transactions. And for me, the transactions that matter are transactions where people do ex ante tech transfer. Somebody comes up with an idea and they get it to people who have yet to independently invent it. Okay? And why don't we just have a system where if you have a bright idea, you want to distribute it to others, we're going to try to support you in selling it. We're not trying to induce people, right? And so, in a way, it's a neutral platform. Right? We're just going to set it up so this is available for those people who want to become professional creators. In a way, we'll try to protect or uh, um, <clears throat> prevent some harms to the system, but we're not going to set up some kind of reward where we want to draw people into it. By drawing people into it, we've distorted things like certain price signals, and I think that's what leads to some of the utilitarian problems. And so let's just try to avoid that from the get-go. And the one way to frame it is rather than we're trying to get you a reward, we're trying to tell you, if you're a patentee, you have some kind of invention. There are people out there who have yet to independently invent it, Go find them, and you are the exclusive supplier of that invention to them. And so the one maybe twist to the system, um, and so that all, I think, makes sense. There's a heavy focus on what we call ex ante tech transfer. This is, by design, something that trolls are excluded from, like the troll behavior of uh, ex, uh, um, or, uh, ex post licensing just doesn't even fit into the story. It wouldn't be something that would be supported. But there's one caveat, which I think is problematic from a uh, descriptive sense. You would need to figure some way to get an obligation to transfer technology. I've tried to make arguments that our current system could have that by arguing that you could have nominal damages for uh, unpracticed patents. And so that rather than having an obligation, we just said, look, you have a patent, but unless you're actually transferring ex ante the technology, you just get one dollar for an infringement. Uh, um, but we can talk about that a little bit. But anyway, I think that there's some benefits here. How much time? Two minutes? Right here. So there's some advantages. <clears throat> so like I said, it's a neutral platform. We're not trying to induce. We're just saying, hey, there is this market. And in, in a sense, this is one of the reasons why I support a property view, because we're just trying to extend uh, the property system to allow somebody to create an idea and then sell it. Now, we have to think about it quite differently, because the resource is different. And so it isn't just sell it to one exclusive person. We know this idea can be used by many, so your obligation is to sell it to everybody. And so, maybe I'm jumping out of order here, but excluding others is a bug. When we see somebody excluded who wants to use it, that's a problem. Well, wait a minute. You, you invented, you had an obligation to try to get this out to as many people as possible. So maybe we can talk about some of the details there. But that feels different to me. Um, and then you have this idea, we're not trying to induce, we just have a platform. And then, I think one of the real benefits, and this is what we talk about, I think there's inherently a positive cost-benefit analysis to this when it comes to utilitarianism. If what you're doing is you're just trying to sell your idea to others, I think the case can be made via the Samuelson condition that if you can stay in business, so that you can be a professional inventor, meaning I can come up with an idea, and if my business is I sell it to other people who have yet to independently invent it, if you can keep yourself in business, meaning this is something you want to do rather than some alternative activity in the economy, I think this has to be something that's socially beneficial. I think you could show that. We can maybe fight about that. But that's something nice, that on the micro level, we're not doing things with re rewards. We're saying, well, let's give a reward today to this patentee, 
Hopefully that will induce others to become uh, inventors in the future and ultimately we'll get this optimal level. We're saying when we see these kinds of transactions happening and an inventor can stay in business as a professional, meaning making all their money from coming up with ideas and distributing it to those who use it, we can, I think, say this is socially beneficial. And that's kind of nice. That's actually a part of the patent system that we can say, this actually has utilitarian support. So that's what I, it's a slight tweak on the system. We're no longer rewarding. We're talking about ex ante transactions alone. And I think if we start thinking about the patent system that way, we can change the utilitarian uh, quagmire. And I think that ultimately what we really want is not just a system that has utilitarian support, but one that can support for all these different theories, right? And so we can come back and say, okay, it's got utilitarian support. You're not a fan? Let me show you some other ways in which I can support roughly the same system. Um, and so that's the hope. I haven't demonstrated that here yet, but this is sort of a direction that I would like to go in. But the main idea is maybe we should tweak the general purpose of the system a little bit um, before we, we, we try to kill ourselves trying to provide justification. So that's it. Thanks, Chris. legitimate 
And if they view it as less legitimate, they will be less inclined to follow the law, and we have a bunch of data on that. But we also care about it for functionality reasons. Um, the clearest point to make is with consumers and users of IP, given the ease of copying created by modern technological advance, right, in any field where patentees cannot unilaterally control copying, widespread voluntary compliance is really necessary for the system to work well, uh, and so we care about user and consumer understanding. We also care about creator understanding. Certainly there are lots of sophisticated creators out there, but I think there are also lots of unsophisticated, unsophisticated creators whose understanding we would expect to mirror general public knowledge, and so for all those individual inventors or artists or authors, and I think lots of folks working at startups and small firms whose innovation and creativity we really care about, they're going to have more of a background, common knowledge of IP than more sophisticated <coughs> knowledge. Um, jurors, obviously, some policymakers, I think we're talking about them as well. Now, certainly the connection, the relationship between human understanding and the success of the IP system will vary a lot depending on industry and context. So I'm not saying uh, it's sort of equal across the board. I'm just arguing that it matters significantly. Uh, it's an important piece of the puzzle in some industries, in some contexts that we care about. So let me talk about data a little bit. I'll start with lay perception since we're there. I'll actually skip this slide for time. So Christina Olson and Annie Fast, who study this uh, psychology or psychologists, uh, and I have gotten together and done a lot of experiments now. Um, and here's just, here's just one sample which sort of got directly at this basis question. Um, after sort of some, some, some leaded information asking people uh, about their understanding of the basis for IP, right? And what we find out is that the modal response actually isn't any of the traditionally identified objectives. Rather, it's this anti-plagiarism idea that you should not be copying someone else's ideas and claiming them as your own. Uh, now that's a sort of conceptual look at IP law. Maybe people feel differently if we ask them in context. Um, Follow-up studies where we sort of develop particular vignettes in a whole bunch of subject matter. I'll just tell you what this shows is that people think IP rights are too strong. Um, and that's especially true when we're talking about copying of expression as opposed to just completely knocking off a product. Even when you're talking about knocking off a product, lots of people say you should be able to do it. Uh, but when you're talking about taking something in the form of expression, in each scenario tested which would be prohibited by a, uh, IP law, the majority of people across these subject matters think that that copying of expression should be allowed without license, without permission, uh, etc. Some additional tests we did sort of explore this plagiarism question by asking about attribution. So in the baseline scenarios, there was just a base copying without permission, without attribution, without anything. And then we added a condition where attribution is provided. So again, still no permission, still would be infringement under the law. Um, and what we see is that almost two thirds of subjects, sub, uh, something across the subject matters, would support naked copying as long as you provide attribution. This is true in semiconductors, it's true in pharma, right? So this is not just sort of uh, literary copying or, 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 or something like that. And so we dub these findings the plagiarism fallacy, uh, which is that the popular perception of IP rights is that they are designed to prevent plagiarism, not to incentivize creative effort, not to uh, promote natural rights or expressive rights. So public opinion seems misaligned with IP law. Maybe we can change it, right? Um, now the evidence from the efforts of the RIAA and MPAA are that you can't that much, but we just still explored it. And so we did some uh, tests with sort of gathering knowledge information. Unsurprisingly, people have a very low level of knowledge about IP law. I think surprisingly, the knowledge of IP law does not affect people's preferences about how strong the law should be. So simply giving people information about the law doesn't seem to work. Well, maybe if we really explain the law to them, explain the basis to them. And so here it got fun. We got to make up sort of lengthy explanations about the basis for IP law. Um, and you can see all the ones we tried. And in each case, I got to get, I got to do a little fictional writing to explain how the Constitution and famous inventors and authors across centuries and current IP disputes all explain why one of these is the reason why we have IP law. 
right? And so this is a, a sort of a, 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 a richer crime than I think we could ever expect to occur in the real world, and we find it has no effect, at least for the traditionally identified basis. But this gets fun. If we explain a commons basis, something very angled on the public domain, the value of sharing information, or if we can create an explanation based on anti-plagiarism, it has an effect and people think IP rights should be weaker. So we're seeing this sort of one-way ratchet where explanations about the basis for IP law, uh, it's very hard to convince people IP rights should be stronger. It seems much easier to convince them that IP rights should be weaker. Or the explanations that are more salient are the ones that indicate protection should be weaker. Um, so, so, that's, uh, that's all the public. Let's talk about attorneys very briefly. Lisa Larimore Lex, Maggie Whitlin, and I are exploring uh, sort of the culture wars in IP question, trying to understand what leads uh, IP experts, IP attorneys in this case, to have different opinions about intellectual property law, about the strength of IP rights. And so this is just one little piece I pulled out. We're still gathering the data. But we asked them about the basis for IP, and you can see the results. IP attorneys think that it has an incentive basis. Right? So somewhere between the point that you go from a member to the public, go through law school, start practicing IP law, um, you are indoctrinated into this incentives basis. Um, now I still get a little bit of the anti-plagiarism and a little bit of natural, uh, uh, of natural rights. Um, I will tell you that how long someone has been practicing IP does not, uh, it does not have a statistically significant effect on, on these percentage, percentages, at least in the pool of people we have so far. So it seems to be once you start to practice IP, you have the incentives theory in mind, and that, and that stays with you uh, over time. Um, one other result, uh, sort of preliminary result that seems to be coming out is that depending on attorneys' perceptions of the basis for IP rights, it affects how strong they think the rights should be, but that varies by IP field. So incentive basis folks think that patent rights should be stronger, but plagiarism folks think that copyright and trademark rights um, should, be, should be stronger. Uh, so I think I'm, I'm running out of time, right? So I'll just wrap up and uh, right, all of these wrap up points are of course simply positive statements, not normative statements. Um, I think IP law faces significant legitimacy challenges under each of its traditionally conceived bases, uh, at least among the public at large. And in terms of law's ability to function uh, to meet its desired ends, we can tell an incentive story in certain uh, situations. What are those situations going to be? Those are going to be for parties or industries that are, rep that are sort of sophisticated parties are represented by IP attorneys and that work in fields, uh, produce products, processes, uh, works of authorship, in fields where they can unilaterally control copy, right? In other areas, it's going to be much harder for the incentive basis to work. Uh, so right, we can play about what industries might fit that mold. Farm is one that jumps out. Um, semiconductors, right? perhaps. First run movie production, perhaps. Uh, the natural rights and expressive bases are, bases are going to have a hard time uh, functioning as accurate drivers of IP protection in the real world. Um, in any, sort of in any model, because both I, neither IP attorneys nor the public at large um, understands those as the basis of IP, and experiments based on promoting those as the, ba as the basis for IP do not have statistically significant effects. Thank you.
I know I am the last person for lunch, and I don't have slides to entertain you, so I'll do my best to keep you entertained just by speaking. Uh, no promises, though. Um, I'm going to be speaking about human development as an intellectual property metric, and my presentation is slightly different because I write on international and comparative inter inter intellectual property law, so I'm taking an interna international perspective here. So my, uh, I'm going to highlight a few points from my, my essay. My thesis is basically that intellectual property is about people, and it is about improving the human condition. And that our metrics should reflect intellectual property's role in improving the human condition. Normally we think about intellectual property law and policy as innovation policy or cultural policy, but I'm arguing to reframe it as development policy. I'm going to speak first about why human development, how it applies across frameworks of international perspective, and I'll finish by talking to you briefly about the Human Development Index. Now, human development, I'm arguing, is at the heart of intellectual property, not as a byproduct of intellectual property, not as something that occurs along the way, but as the core of what intellectual property law should be doing. This is because of human progress, whether it's characterized as individual autonomy, expression, scientific innovation, dignity, is, I think, at the core of what intellectual property law is about. Now, my arguments are not mainstream, admittedly, but I'm not the first to connect human development to intellectual property. So, Scholars such as uh, Madhavi Sunder, who writes about intellectual property and culture, has made the connection between culture and intellectual property and human flourish flourishing. Mark Maggie Chan speaks about expanding the public goods that we think intellectual property can achieve by taking into consideration things like equality. Other scholars have written about human flourishing. I know Brett Fishman has recently um, written something about the connection between the law and economics approach and human flourishing. So this connection between intellectual property and development is not mainstream, but it's not novel either. Now, what I'm doing differently here is that I'm proposing that we use human development as a metric, human development and not human flourishing or human rights, even though they're closely related. And secondly, my proposal that we use human development as a metric assumes that development is at the core of intellectual property law and policy. Again, the IP is about people and about improving the human condition. So I'm proposing adapting the factors that we use in calculating the Human Development Index, which looks at economic growth, um, health, and education, adapting those factors and using that tool adapted to intellectual property law. I'm going to speak um, a little bit about the, how, why I think human development is at the core of intellectual property and why human development as a metric. I think the metrics have to relate to the purposes of the law. And metrics like measuring, for instance, the amount of patenting activity or the amount of trademarking activity that we have in a particular society is useful only if we think that more intellectual property is better. But we don't know that more intellectual property is better. There are different justifications for intellectual property, as we've heard this morning, but in my view, human development captures much of what intellectual property law, as it relates to human beings, seeks to accomplish. So we can think about intellectual property and how it impacts health, if we think about medicines, if we think about copyright and education, if we think about books and literacy, we think about wealth generation and economic growth. The reasons for protecting as well. When we think about the reasons why we protect the creator, why we value the creator, is because we value the creator as a human being, but we also value that creator's contributions to humanity. When we talk about stimulating innovation, we, we're interested in stimulating innovation because we think that these innovations are going to promote progress, that they're going to improve the human condition. So I think that both natural rights and utilitarian frameworks value improving the human condition. I would, characterize, I would characterize natural rights theorists as focusing more on the individual, the individual's dignity and the indi individual entitlement, whereas utilitarians are concerned more with the societal welfare, but they both, I would argue, are interested in improving the human condition. 
from an international and comparative perspective, um, looking globally, there is no agreed upon international justification for inter 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 eh, intellectual property. Um, but I would still argue that human development is a common factor. So in the United States context, in the US, people often refer to the Progress Clause and use the Progress Clause as a guide for what copyright and patent law should do. If we just compare with Canada, right next door, for instance, Canada doesn't have any constitutional clause that speaks of progress or guides what IP should do in, in the Canadian system. And as Danielle Jarre has argued, the purpose of copyright in Canada was not clear. The courts have clarified to some extent that the purpose of copyright is based on a mix of English and French traditions, a mix of, a mix of natural rights and utilitarianism, um, but still generally instrumentalist. I give Canada just as an example, because often we think of what is progress in the US context, but in a system where we're operating globally and we have international treaties, we have to think about what does intellectual property mean in the global context. Institutionally, in the international space, there has been a long connection between intellectual property and human development as well. This is evident from things like the WIPO development agenda and even just the World Trade Organization intellectual property agreement and the exceptions for developing countries that were there from the beginning. Now, I would argue that the WTO agreement that harmonized intellectual property standards and created this enforcement mechanism exacerbated the tensions and the perceived imbalance in intellectual property because we've shifted to focusing on the economic considerations and not considering other factors such as health and education. Now, the balancing that we need to do in intellectual property at the international level, I would argue, should be, should be balancing that is done with a view to human development. We speak about balancing the interests of users and producers of intellectual property. How do we make sure we produce enough that we have enough access? Well, how do we figure out what that balance should be? I would argue that we should do that with a view to human development. What am I talking about when I talk about human development? I mentioned it briefly early on, economic, health, and education considerations. So the United Nations um, Development Program has for over 20 years been using this human development index that it uses to rank countries in terms of their progress in human development. And this was based on the recognition that ec economics alone are not enough. So it allows us to account for economic growth as well as human flourishing in terms of health and education. So I'm not advocating a rejection of the economic model. I think the human development factors allow us to take into consideration more than economic interests. And so for instance, if we think about um, copyright, so there was a study on copyright piracy. How does copyright affect education? How does copyright affect literacy? That is something that one could measure. And then you would also consider, for instance, what is the impact on the economic situation of the creator. You could think about food-related patents and how the food-related patents have an implication in terms of access to food and health outcomes. You could also look at whether, for instance, is it increasing the food supply or is it leading to restrictions that make it difficult for farmers to engage in traditional farming practices, for instance. Human development, in my view, prioritizes human interests. And I, I would argue that the negative, and there has been a negative reaction to intellectual property protection at the international level. I would argue that the negative response has been due to this perception that intellectual property facilitates corporate goals at the expense of human interests. And while we have many human users of the intellectual property system, if you look at who owns a number of patents, most of the patents, you have a lot of corporations, corporate owners of IP, and they're perceived as the beneficiaries of the system. Inter the international agreements have also been applied such that the economic benefit to the intellectual property owners has been prioritized. And human development concerns like health and education have been relegated to the periphery of IP. 
So I would argue that using the human development index factors, again, which is including economics, health, and education, to evaluate intellectual property law and policy could lead to developing IP law and policy that prioritizes human interests. So individual human dignity is protected by the human de development factors. Um, and maximizing social welfare can also be achieved by looking at the human development factors. So for instance, the example that we had earlier about whether we have creators um, be you know, forced into slavery basically to produce, if we're looking at something like human development, even under a natural rights approach, you wouldn't do that. Um, Human development under a natural rights approach would be used as a guiding value, as I'm proposing it. So when you have conflicting rights, you would say, it's the right going to uh, promote human development, or is it going to reduce human development? If you're looking at human, human development under a utilitarian framework, human development would be the objective against which we would measure the IP outcomes. So I'm suggesting in conclusion that you could use the human development factors as a guiding value in natural rights, as an objective in the utilitarian framework to create intellectual property laws and policies that promote human development. I welcome your comments, and this is still a work in progress, so I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.
So I could choose, so, I could choose essentially not to license. Well, maybe. So now this is where it gets interesting. And then, now this is some of the, this is why it's still being worked on. Right? Uh, so now the question is, so the easy case is established royalty. Right? So when we come to damages, we say, the judge is like, look, here is this, uh, uh, let's say here we have somebody who's liable, they're using the invention, How, what are the damages? Well, you know, if there's an established royalty, we know how much to, to, to have for damages. The hard cases are when we don't have that. And so what might be interesting, so we're heading towards, well, part of this relies heavily on, for users of technology, this would probably, this whole thing would be protected, I would hope, by a liability. So that means that if you're a user of technology, you will never be excluded, but you'll have to pay. Okay? And that, the benefit of that is that this is what we think should happen with technology. Users should get to use it, but they, the question then becomes how much do they have to pay? How do we set what that price is? And I'm worried about, so there's, I'm not sure I've solved it, right? But the trick is if we say, all right, uh, sure, there's an established royalty, inventor sets it, then the inventor can effectively exclude by just setting the price high. If we go the other way, then, we're, 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 we're in, in some ways um, going to uh, force some people not to become inventors because of like, the, the price that I can recoup from these people who are just never going to pay whatever I ask voluntarily um, it, it, it is not going to be enough, so I'm not going to invent. And so I got to work on it, but that's uh, the general gist of what I'm having. Jessica? Yeah, I wanted to ask a sort of a meta question about for the panelists because there's an underlying assumption in all the papers about what, what law is, actually. Um, that is, is law a constitutive practice that comes from behavior? Like, with me, you're talking about that the relationship between infringement standards and creative practices gets confused at some adjudicative process, for example? Or is the function of, is, is law a normative international system that works both from local levels and top down um, you know, UN or WTO, um, you know, and Greg, you're talking about the legitimacy of law in terms of the people who perceive it versus the formal rules. It seems like the, one of the major problems methodologically, you don't have to call it a problem, but it's an underlying assumption, is you have to start with the principle of what it is that you're studying, what is it that you're studying, what is the law that you're studying that you either want to change or you want to explain? Does that make sense? And it seems like all of you might be starting from different places. Like, what is the, you know, it's a social system, it's a formal rule-based system, it's a, you know, so. I think if you all of you love me, what I see as law is derived to the context. I can't hear you. I, what I think of as law is derived to a significant degree from contextual factors. I think law takes different shapes and all of the above, depending on what context you Right, but for the question of doing the study of music copyright, for example, or whether the patent system is working, for example, don't you have to explain that as a baseline? Or do you think that's not actually necessary for the knowledge that's being produced about the IP? Uh, I think that's a great question. I think from an international perspective, so I am looking at the law as, to some extent, coming from the national level and being fed up at the international level, but the international le level also feeding back down to the national level. But I think with, with my argument, what I'm suggesting is that you could give countries actually quite a lot of flexibility to determine what the law should be. I mean, I just want to, I, it sounds like for you, law is a form of political relationships. That, that is what a political scientist would say. You know, I think at some level, when you're talking about international law, it does become political. But I don't want to say it's purely political, because then people say there's no such thing as law and international law. And I think as long as you have, um, you have mechanisms, like the WTO dispute um, resolution system, where you can say to the countries, this is what you have to do, that you have a requirement that um, you have to have at least copyright of life plus 50. I mean, that comes from international law, right? That's an obligation that states have taken on. So I don't think it's just politics. I think there is something substantive there. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Okay. It exemplifies the issue. I would, I would add one thing, at least for me, so again, you know, you're asking. Uh, I would think, I think uh, uh, an important way, especially we're trying to move forward with the IP system, especially the patent system, that I want to view that as a, uh, uh, 
a system of behavior that exists outside of the courtroom, outside of the shadow of litigation, where I see socially beneficial activity. The litigation system is a way to reinforce and protect that, right? And so it is a set of sort of behavior. Um, and in this sense, um, we were having some you know, earlier discussion. Rob, Rob mentioned uh, in his critique or in his response, was talking about a Holmes and and and, and, uh, uh, and Posner having this sort of deep law and econ, or Holmes even Batman and you. I would go further than that, say someone like H. L. A. Hart really is like, look, we want people to have this internal perspective. And that, for me, is important because that does bring in some sense of morality. Yeah. But it is a morality about why we should be behaving a certain way out there in the world, not because we're worried that there'll be a cease and desist letter. We're looking at each other like, I got something, and this is where my story kind of comes from. It's like, I got something valuable. I can, we can do some kind of exchange. We'll both be better off. And then the patent lawyers mm -hmm. and the system is there to protect that. And so the, the behavior comes first, the which is primary. I think sort of your question circulates around the IP values uh, issue, right? What law is will look different if we accept the utilitarian or incentive framework versus the natural rights framework. And that's only sort of one part of the question, or other what, what, what is law, uh, what law is kinds of questions out but there. But we, we, we could have formal law reflect perceptions more. We could, have a, we could, have, we could aim towards alignment. For example, right. if we thought that law is supposed to reflect normative commitments, you know, which is what your paper is suggesting, it not well, entirely, but right, it's I would say I'm suggesting, but I mean, I think your, your question is a great one. I think it's easy to answer for my paper, which is when I'm talking about legitimacy. Um, again, it's not that's not a normative statement, but I'm trying to reflect on whether right the law yeah. legitimacy refers to whether people perceive the law as legitimate uh, functionalities or. I want to jump in actually and ask you a follow-up question, Greg, which was I, I heard the, I, I saw the evidence of how people responded when you kind of gave them the conventional um, three theories about IP and did that affect their view on um, how strong or weak the law should be and when they bought those theories. And it sounds like they didn't really buy those theories. Um, but my, my, my question is, um, did you ever, with some of the follow-up questioning that you did and asking about the um, anti-plagiarism norms, did you, did you, in any of the questions, take it a step further and ask them why is it that plagiarism is wrong? And if so, you know, is there any sense in which that, asking at that level, there was some overlap with the story of the three uh, conventional justifications for IP? Yeah, so, so we did explore that along the opposite order. Okay. Um, so we purposely tried to begin the studies uh, making as few assumptions as we could uh, about sort of people's understanding. So we began with sort of very exploratory questions about how people felt about copying. Uh, we started with totally acontextual questions about copying, so not introducing any concept of IP rights, just copying. And what we get is this uh, sort of open-ended questions overwhelmingly uh, respondents have an ethical or moral opposition to, to, to copying. Nearly everyone thinks it's wrong. Uh, you know, a few people think it's okay in some circumstances. Almost no one says it's okay, period. Uh, and when people describe why they think it's wrong, it's all rooted in sort of copying as theft ideas. And I think that's the anti-plagiarism uh, idea. And so then we followed up sort of circling around IP and that kind of stuff. So I think, it, it, I think what happens with IP um, is sort of that people know there's some IP out of law out there that prohibits copying. And they search for a moral or ethical hook for it, right? And there's not a natural one. Um, or at least the sort of kind of natural ones we might argue about uh, aren't very salient with people. And so they end up banging it on. Well, I know plagiarism is bad. I know taking those ideas is bad. And so they sort of come around to it in that direction. At least, you know, that's sort of my best guess about what's going on. Um, let's see, in the back, you had to first. Uh, my, my question is directed to, uh, I think I'm pronouncing the name right, uh, Professor Setu, to, um, it's in relation to, I, I just want to link your presentation back to previous uh, presentations on values uh, I see you're working IP and development, specifically human development. Uh, as I do understand, uh, the issue of development is very, very uh, contested. We don't even have a shared understanding of the meanings of development, let alone the uh, uh, a consensus of what they actually mean. So, uh, what, um, uh, what pressure? 
Mm -hmm. If I have a hip hop music case and my jury is full of people who listen to only Mozart, right? That is going to be a very different, we're going to have probably have a different outcome than if it's people that listen to primarily hip hop. And I think understanding that, you know, I, I, I'm not sure I've reached a conclusion on how we deal with that, but I think the first stage is to grapple with and recognize that that's a potential problem. And I have musical conversations on both sides, and sometimes I'm very puzzled. People with certain kinds of musical experience have absolutely no understanding. We have to, because we can all hear and listen to mm -hmm. music, we can assume that we have a sure common understanding. I think that's an incorrect assumption. So what I'm trying to do is test the values in that, and then think about how do we think about how, to, how that should shape how we actually think about it. So the answer to your question would be really easy if only the first panel had answered for us what these values were. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, the way oh, no. we could pursue them would be helpful. We weren't clear on that point. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's you know right. This is part of the rich discussion that's going on. Um, I think you know we're go we're going to continue to dispute what we're trying to do with the IP system. So the functionality points, I think. I have so far, and hopefully more data. Um, sort of people can give or take depending on their view of the system. Is I think the legitimacy questions are a real concern, sort of under any model. Um, you know, there's a lot of literature uh, in law and in other fields and some experimental data about the problems you get into when you have laws that are perceived as, as, as illegitimate. You have that problem. I think it's something to. It's worth thinking about how to tackle it. Um, I don't have the answer to, right, should the law move closer to uh, human perception or certain humans' perceptions, or should we figure out other ways? But I do think that's sort of something we should struggle with. Um, in the interest of equity, yes, in the back. I just have a question. It, you know, one of the other things when you look at IP law is it's, it's so difficult to define the inventive process or the creative process to get there is part of the problem not taking into account what the, the creators of IP and what it takes to do that, and then translate it into an IP system. That's part of the street If you look at the human condition, and I don't want to use the word reward because I'm talking about the early part of the process to get the patent for the copyright and trademark. Is that what's missing once the intellectual property is developed? Um, if I, if I, I'm not sure I understand your question precisely, but I, think, but I think my answer would be yes. I mean, that's certainly part of the equation. Um, I would sort of love to run some of these studies on, you know, creators per se. It's it's a hard group to tie down, um, and that's you know, and, and that's a good thing for society. It's a tough thing for uh, experimental uh, for experimental. Um, I was going to say to, to Gina, I just remembered, I have sort of thought about maybe look at law students, uh, because one of my sort of, sort of questions that jumps out from this, right, is this is an indoctrination versus understanding. So it doesn't happen during law school. Uh, you look at law students before and after they're taking intro to IP course, right? So this uh, click that goes on, that goes on. So um, we're running up against lunch, but how about the last two questions from Irene and Houghton? If you want to state your questions and then we'll take the answers from the panelists. Start or be short? <laughs> <laughs> she said it, I did. <laughs> okay. oh, Go for me? it. Well, uh, I've got a question for uh, Fumi, uh, so about distribution music. So creation music is one thing, and distribution music is another thing. Uh, I found that you know, uh, Taylor Swift's song, uh, uh, Shake It, yeah. Shake It Up, it has accumulated 1.5 billion views on YouTube. So, uh, and uh, the iTunes uh, streaming service, which just costs us uh, ten dollars per month, then you can own the, you can have access to the largest uh, music library in the world. So I wonder whether your uh, uh, book project deals with the distribution issue, especially when it comes to the distribution music via uh, digital media. And uh, can I ask a quick question? Uh, Extremely quick. Quick. Okay. Quick. Why uh, I, I, uh, why IP? Why there is no zero uh, acceptance of IP as a, you know expressive right? I think Jeannie has uh, worked on it, expressive incentives. So why any political, cultural, uh, blah blah reasons for the denial? And Irene, why don't you go ahead and ask? Um, <coughs> I think 
Uh, Greg Paper points out a very important issue that is the role of biases uh, in the attribution of values and then methodology. When you look at pre indoctrination and post indoctrination, uh, how people think differently, and then uh, the, the, the assumption that we make in terms of values, I think it's really interesting to look at that also multinationally. Uh, French value trademarks more than patent out because again it becomes part of the, the culture, part of the values, part of the trade, and uh, and I think that really shapes all the discussion about about values and methodologies within the U.S. within different constituencies of the U.S. and uh, I think you know um, that that's a question for everybody. I think that the, the biases that we a scholar think is objective, but then we think in terms of efficiency rather than in terms of, or we think more if we are activists in terms of redistribution, distributive justice and support are crucial in all this debate. And many times we think they're objective, but they are really not as objective as we think. Um, so very quickly on that, completely agree, uh, as I think we may discuss a little, I'm actually currently running uh, some cross-cultural studies to look at Chinese perceptions of intellectual property and property rights uh, compared to Hopefully we'll have some part, part of those answers in the future. Um, and um, why, why attorneys don't believe in expressive rights? Remember, the, the general public does, um, at least you know, so over, over 20% does. Um, you know, I think in, in US law schools, one of the things to explore, um, expressive rights don't get, don't get a lot of play. Um, incentives obviously strongly do. Uh, I think natural rights get a little bit, but expressive rights don't. Just in short, I actually would get thinking about creation and distribution. Because I think part of what we're talking about the distribution of side of digital era list, how do you um, listen and repeat it? Those are acts of collaboration. I think we can think about them affirmatively in order to that extent. Well, please join me in thanking our panel. Can we leave our stuff here or is it not? Uh,